But I guess I can go ahead and introduce Jeff Cohen, huh? Rachel is not there. Okay, I'll just I'll just do it. I'm gonna thanks so much, David. You're always fantastic. Jeff Cohen, founder of the Media Watch Group Fair and co-founded Roots Roots Action. He is a columnist. Is Jeff there? Yes. Okay. Yes. He is a columnist. There he is. Uh, former TV pundit and author of Cable News Confidential: My Misadventures in Corporate Media. He has a new show on Free Speech TV called Just Solutions. And I also want to mention that you were, I believe, the producer for Phil uh, Donahue when he was on NBC, and that whole story where they dumped the show when you were the number one rated show because they were talking about what we we're talking about today. Anyway, Jeff, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Frank. And I'm going to talk about the Phil Donahue censorship. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this event. I've learned an awful lot. Uh, today, progressives are valiantly fighting against racism and inequality in our country. But a lot of progressive groups never talk about US foreign policy. As my colleague David Swanson's always saying, they seem to be ignoring 96% of humanity. And I would argue that US, that racism is at least as devastating in US foreign policy as it is in US domestic policy. And that racism has been an underpinning of US foreign policy, certainly through the decades of the Cold War, which was allegedly a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, but few Russians were killed. Uh, while US foreign policy was massacring people of color, largely civilians, from Southeast Asia to Southern Africa to Central America and beyond. Midway through the Cold War, Martin Luther King Jr. in April 67 came to New York City and did a speech at Riverside Church. It was not just a speech against the Vietnam War. Indeed, the speech was titled Beyond Vietnam. It was a criticism of the racist and imperial underpinnings of US foreign policy uh, during the Cold War. King said that the US was on the wrong side of a world revolution from Vietnam to South Africa to Latin America. King criticized what he called our alliance with the landed gentry of Latin America. He asked, why is the US suppressing revolutions of the shirtless and barefoot people of global south instead of supporting these revolutions and then he commented complaining of quote capitalists of the west investing huge sums of money in asia africa and south america only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries unquote that speech is generally not allowed to be heard in mainstream media today but it was heard loud and clear back in 1967. And it was a reflection of the Cold War hysteria in the US news media that so many liberal outlets denounced King's speech. The New York Times had an editorial denouncing the speech. The Washington Post patronized, quote, King has diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, his people, unquote. Life magazine engaged in classic media red baiting when they referred to the speech as quote, demagogic slander that sounded like a script for radio Hanoi, unquote. Now, as soon as the Cold War started in the 1940s, it was accompanied by red baiting and the blacklist here in the US that deeply undermined US media and did so for many decades including up to the 2003 when I was at MSNBC and was politically purged from my job alongside Phil Donahue. Overseas wars, whether they're hot wars or cold wars, have always led to repression and censorship here at home. Uh, the blacklist, of course, had a devastating impact on Hollywood. We heard from an earlier speaker, a devastating impact on unions and union activists, but it also had a devastating impact on the US news media, 
where reporters, editors, producers had to pledge loyalty against communism. George Clooney made an excellent movie celebrating Edward R. Murrow for having taken on the red baiting Senator Joe McCarthy late in 1953. But I've never seen a Hollywood movie about the US journalists that were red baited and purged, including friends of Edward R. Murrow that he did not defend and, and, new, and journalists at other outlets. Television remains a dominant medium in our country. And it was forged, it was birthed at the time of the Cold War and the blacklist. And that put a stamp on television and television news that has continued up through the present day. I founded the Media Watch Group Fair in 1986. And I immediately started having meetings with executives at television news, CNN, PBS, ABC News. And this was decades after the blacklist had ended. And with documentation, I went to these executives and I said, in your debates of the right versus the left, you have fire breathing right wingers like Pat Buchanan and Bob Novak, uh, but you don't allow any genuine leftist, even mild mannered leftist to appear with the fire breathing right wingers. Instead, the left is represented by these forever backpedaling, retreating, mealy mouth corporate Cold War liberals. And these executives knew what they were doing. Noam Chomsky, for example, was off limits at these TV news channels. Noam Chomsky, who appeared at that time and now in mainstream news outlets across the globe, on public television across the globe, except in the country where he lives and the country that he analyzes the most closely. At CNN, an executive tried to placate me by reminding me that he had once worked in a campaign that was led by Jim Hightower. And I had to point out to him, but you don't allow Jim Hightower or other genuine progressives to appear on CNN. When I was at ABC, I had this discussion with Ted Koppel where I said, FAIR's research has proven that if you're gonna be a US guest that discusses US foreign policy on Nightline, you have to have been someone with experience in the US foreign policy establishment. So I said, given that requirement, I'm wondering why have you never booked a Daniel Ellsberg as a guest? because he was in the foreign policy establishment before he joined the peace movement. And Koppel's reaction was, I think Daniel Ellsberg is very brave. He shows a lot of courage, but he strikes me as something of an extremist. At which point I immediately responded that Fair's research had shown that extremism shouldn't bother you at all, Mr. Koppel. Your most frequent guests, the ones that appear over and over, are Elliot Abrams, Jerry Falwell, Patrick Buchanan, Al Haig, and Kissinger. Now, um, the Cold War continued to narrow the political spectrum uh, and who's allowed into the debate long after the Soviet Union collapsed. I could still feel the Cold War's impact in 2002 and 2003 when I was working at MSNBC run by NBC News and a new war against Iraq was being cranked up. And I was the senior producer, as, as Frank said, on the most watched program on MSNBC, the Phil Donahue primetime show. And I wanna end my remarks by talking about what I witnessed during that period. One night we booked uh, Ramsey Clark, the former US Attorney General who talked eloquently against this push to invade Iraq. And the next morning, we learned from management how we had screwed up, that Ramsey Clark is not supposed to appear on MSNBC. Uh, this is nearly 50 years after Joe McCarthy 
and there was some sort of blacklist that no one had told us about, and we'd made the mistake of booking Ramsey Clark. Management warned us repeatedly that Phil Donahue was coming across to viewers as un-American, and they actually used that word. As the Iraq invasion grew closer, management took over the Phil Donahue show and they imposed a quota system. They said, if we wanted to book one guest who was opposed to the push toward an invasion of Iraq, we had to have two guests that were pro-invasion. If we booked two guests on the left, we had to have three guests on the right. At one meeting, a producer said, I think I could book Michael Moore for Thursday. And Michael was known as a serious critic of the push toward invading Iraq. And the producer was told, you'll have to have three right wingers for ideological balance. I thought privately about proposing Noam Chomsky as a guest, but you can imagine the problem. Our stage couldn't accommodate the 28 right wingers we would have needed for ideological balance. 10 days after the biggest peace demonstrations in global history, MSNBC canceled the Donahue show for purely political reasons. Did management say, wow, look at the size of these demonstrations. If we unleash Phil Donahue, we're going to have a huge audience. No. For political reasons, they terminated our show. How do I know it was political? Well, memos started leaking out from NBC News. And one of the memos worried that Donahue would be, quote, a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. That memo asserted that Donahue represents, quote, a difficult face for NBC News in a time of war. So Donahue primetime was canceled by MSNBC three weeks before the invasion of Iraq. And a few days before we were canceled, something weird happened. MSNBC announced that they were hiring someone new to host a new program. And the person they were hiring was the far right racist radio talk show host, Michael Savage. So think about that. This legend of television, Phil Donahue, was not an appropriate face for NBC News, but Michael Savage was. And I wanna remind you, and this is my final comment. This was 50 years after, 5-0, 50 years after the rise of Senator Joe McCarthy and more than a decade after the Soviet Union collapsed. The Cold War was persisting in US news media and still does to this day. Thank you. And thanks for organizing this event. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Me, man. OK, well, Rachel's not there again. So I guess I'll go ahead and introduce our next uh, speaker and a uh, testifier being Professor Peter McLaren. No, I'm, I'm, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, there you are. Sorry, You're Frank. Okay. I'll take it yeah. back. Take... No, I'm sorry, I was okay. muted on the other place. Did okay. you, that was devastating uh, testimony, uh, Jeff. And do you know, Frank, that we are passing, uh, we're putting Ed to the end? Okay, I just want to yeah. say that, no, yeah, okay. So, yeah. I so if people, okay, so if people came on, um, thank you, sorry, my bad, uh, Frank. That we are we are moving um, Ed Rumpel's um, testimony to the end, but I want to say, give him a shout out that um, he came up with the first project. We're all looking for what to do, what to do. He came up with the first project. Uh, we are going to help put on a Cold War film festival um, after this. So we don't. This is not the end of it. We want more and more things to come from this. And so far, I have three or four things: a film festival. Ed Rumpel, Alice Slater has suggested a U.S.-Russia Cold War Truth Commission. Let's involve the Russians in this. Mickey Huff was mentioning congressional action tomorrow, uh, or and I say tomorrow, and um, taking on the, the Cold War um, and mixing it with the January 6th um, debacle at the Capitol. So thank you very much and continue, Frank. And then we're going to move into uh, 